Previously on Unpacked. My abuse happened between the age of 6 and 12. We don't share. We don't share that our vulnerabilities. The best thing he did was to open the Bible and tell me how guilty and sinful I was. You can be who you are. Nothing can limit you. I think the, the difficult part about your story is us having to acknowledge the role of church in, mm. in rape and protecting it. Um, and obviously everybody knows of the stories of the Roman Catholic Church mm. and the, the jokes that they make about priests. But the reality is while church can play an amazing influence in somebody's life, they can also play a big part in ruining somebody's life. Mm. I mean, my experience with males that I've dealt with is that the, the church take either two roles. And I always say, when, when men come and talk to me, I say, your religion is between you and your God, and you and your priest. And the priest must keep out of this area, and I'll keep out of religion. Because what often men come to us and they say, the priest has asked them that your fate is, for, is already been determined. Mm. So now you have to find out that this happened to you for a reason. What is the reason that this happened to you? Because it's your journey in life. And what are you going to learn from this? And what are, how are you going to fall? For a victim to be able to deal with that, you know, you're now you feeling you, that you've been, you've been raped or you've been, you've been violated. Now you're saying that this is, there's a reason for this to happen and you need to find a journey. And then the other type of um, male comes to me and he's, and he's said, they've said that they've had to go into enormous amounts of praying in groups and with elders to find out what they did wrong. So again, they're protecting the perpetrator, what they did wrong. And so, so religion has got a part in life. But religion, when it comes to victims, they mustn't get involved with trying to put the blame on the victim. And in both those circumstances, they're putting the blame on the victim, not on the perpetrator. You know, I learned a term recently and I'm going to ask for my phone because it's so critical yeah. to what you are saying. I've got it on my phone, so I just have to share this term that I just learned two days ago and now I understand why I had to learn the term. Spiritual bypassing. So I learned the term, thank you so much. The term spiritual bypassing is when you use your spirituality to not address other things. So for instance, a person might be having serious psychological, mental, emotional things that are happening to them. But what do you do? Exactly what you say. Let's pray for hours. Let's search for the why, which, you know, why impose that on a victim to now yes. have to find a reason? Because then if you're looking at it from a religious perspective, you can also say, then why did God have to make it happen to me? You know what I mean? So the spiritual bypassing, yo, it is bad. It is bad, bad, bad. <laughs> It is, I, and I was so glad I learned that mm -hmm. term. I just saw it by mistake on a YouTube video when she was like, this is what spiritual bypassing is, where now you yes. want to cleanse, you want to chase some people, but mm -hmm. you're not actually addressing the Very real sure. issues that you're dealing with. Cool. Yes. Okay. What are you feeling, you know, just sitting with three other gentlemen who've had the same experience as you? Um, you're speaking about it, you know, publicly for the first time. Um, and your circumstances are different in the sense that it's almost like your HIV status became a catalyst to you getting to where you are. I'm learning a lot today. I'm learning a lot to be yourself and to speak out. Learn to speak out and to, what I can say, oh. learn to speak out, yeah and be yourself, open up about things. I want to jump onto the intimate relationships because, you know, it's, it's a different experience with family, with parents. Um, you mentioned that you had fought with your partner that night. Mm. 
did they come to actually find out what happened to you after that experience? No. Wow. It kept quiet and then for a month. And then after checking up, after I went to check for my HIV status, and then I called him. I said, dude, this is what's happening. Can you talk? He said, okay. And then I started to open up to him. On that day, you left me in Melville. This is what happened. And then he blocked me. He said, why should I tell this story while tomorrow he's writing his exam? I said, I wanted to tell you because Lendo and I didn't talk to anyone who I dated but you as my partner. He said, and then, oh, he started blocking me everywhere. And then since from then, okay, I tried to reach out to him via his friends. But still today, even today. I don't even know what to say Because the problem, we had no. sex without condoms. So he thought, I did this because I knew. I said, I didn't, knew, I didn't know anything, man. I'm telling you this because you are the one who left me there. You were supposed to take me and drop me home at least again. Than leaving, leaving me where I don't even know because it was my first time to be in Melville. I didn't know anything. It was my first time to be in a gay club. So I thought, okay, I will get help and get home. But this is what happened. I don't even know what to say to that kind of rejection. Um, have you found in your experience, Reese, that a lot of male victims or male survivors um, find that their partners reject them because they make it about them? I think it's, it's all circumstantial in, in different circumstances. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I think in this situation, the rejection is because he's probably blaming you. Mm. Is, is probably blaming you. You went home with them. What, why did that happen? And his rejection is probably, tr he's trying to deal with his own guilt, with his own guilt. So in, 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 in the males that I've, I've dealt with, which is going back to your question is, yes, some of them, all right, have, partners have rejected them for various reasons. Some because they weren't trusted in sharing the experience with. Some, the partners just don't believe it. The partners are putting the position that they were in, the trauma that they were in, they're trying to link it as an excuse for other things. Mm -hmm. So they say, you making, you saying this because you don't provide for me, or you're not good in bed, or you're not mm -hmm. doing that. So they moving it away from being the about that individual's person's behavior and looking at themselves as well and trying to uh, you know the, the difficult thing about dealing with males is is for all of us is to join the dots i think is that joining the dots is so difficult mm -hmm. because to see how everything so, is connected and it's so Man, complex yeah you know what you're making me think of it's almost that thing Man, chip in a bit. yeah yeah come in that, that point is quite poignant. So what my partner used to say, if ever she wanted me to be intimate with her, she would say, you're probably not being intimate because you are probably an, under, an undercover or you're a closet gay. This is a marriage yeah. partner. And each time she would obviously offer sexual advances and I would not respond. She would then beat me up. After beating me up, she would phone her mom and say, I've done one, two, three to him because he's not man enough. And each time our parents would converge a meeting to discuss what had happened, her mom would be the first to say, this would not have happened had he been man enough. It's unfortunate that my daughter has to always to teach him how to be a man. Mm. Meanwhile, I was being that way because I had suppressed anger and trauma from my violent rape that took place when I was younger. And when I failed to be intimate, my partner would often say, you are this because of that. She never at once sought to understand why is he not being intimate? Why when I speak with him, he immediately withdraws? Why is he more prone to walking away than to sit down and communicate openly and honestly? I think um, 
and that's that's so valid um it, us coming to the part about intimacy but i was thinking about something reese when you said a lot of partners will reject uh their their man uh saying to them well this is what's happened to me because they almost want to make it feel like oh you're just using that as an excuse for this the reality is you can be an asshole and be a victim of of mm-hmm. rape yes you can also i'll go even as far as say be the man who is abusing his wife and still be a victim of rape okay. it doesn't excuse your behavior it but it doesn't nullify the fact that you were a victim of rape am i correct in yes. phrasing it that way it's, it's not an excuse yes uh, any male survivor of sexual abuse or rape whatever it is whatever has happened in a male's life it is no excuse to be able to perform and violate somebody else yeah. because of what happened to you and and uh, i mean it's it's that whole myth that often also comes up is that if you were sexually abused or you raped you're going to become a rapist Mm. It's not always the case. I was going to ask you about It's that. It's not always the case because most of the studies that were done about people who were sexually abused who went on to became perpetrators. Most of the research done was done in prisons. Mm. So they've already been caught for some illegal activity mm. and that was the defense that they had used. The probability is that there is a equal probability of being if you were sexually abused going on to become an abuser then if you were not mm. a lot of the manipulators um in dirk situation I I don't know the perpetrator but in dirk situation the perp- the perpetrator wanted the power and the control for him as a dentist in a small community and being so highly respected for him he was getting off putting the whole community and and putting that falsehoods amongst all the community that's what really stimulated him the power and the control that he can manipulate the community the family everybody everybody around him so it's about the power and the control but going back it is no any male has got a choice and it is a choice you have to make if you were sexually abused you got a choice to keep quiet to deal with it mm. you got lots of choices in your life but if you actually go on and become the perpetrator mm. yourself that is a decision you have made because being a pedophile and they might they lots of people might have thoughts about having sex with a young girl or having mm. a young boy the thought is not the illegal activity mm. the legal action is taking that thought and actually putting it into practice because pedia files it's not an instant decision it's not an instant decision it's something you've been thinking about for, for a, a while, long time over. and reacting to it in your situation as well i mean these guys were naked with a gun mm. it wasn't that the circumstances and the passion and it the alcohol it was an opportunist moment one yeah. wasn't and it didn't happen that they knew exactly And this is where a lot of the victims don't realize that the perpetrators out there they had already identified you. You had a dispute, you were vulnerable. You don't know the area because you need help with taxi fire to get. So they've actually joined all these little dots mm-hmm. to actually say here is a candidate for them to have got home and gone into the home first. They were prepared. They knew what they were going to do. They had the gun, and they knew exactly what the modus operandi was going to be for. Because they saw the war fights. No, because also it's not like two men who are friends mm. out at a bar are going to offer to give someone a ride, mm. and then spontaneously decide in the house, should we quickly? Mm. I I actually didn't think about that. And I mean the the reason I was touching on that thing of victims of rape becoming perpetrators. Mm. The person who shared the story with me um served more than 2 decades in prison. And one of the things he shared with me is the 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 men that go in there very young with limited sexual experience mm. are now, you know, we all know the stories of what happens in prison. Mm. You'll have a man who is tied up because he couldn't buy his protection mm. or kill for his protection. He's tied in the toilet and everybody in that entire cell would could be 80 people are mm. invited. 
to have a turn. So mm. now this person is raped by 50 men and mm. it happens over and over and over again. So now what happens? One day he's released from prison. He might have been, even been there for a petty crime, but that's not even relevant. He's released from prison and he's incapable to have the tools to form any intimate relationship mm. with anybody. So the reason that it, it, it becomes, it would become easier for them to prey on the vulnerable is because now you don't have to say, hi, mm. Reese, nice to meet you. What are your interests? Mm. Let's take the time. They, they don't have to deal with that because th those tools are gone mm. and that trust is broken. They have been, been you know, diminished to their most, I, I, I can't even think of a better way, but it's almost like your most lowest part of how you feel about yourself. So as, as we are socialized by our parents and by our society, just like if, if you are religious and you want to not have any sexual activity until you're married, that is a choice. But males ourselves, right, have been socialized to say that is a weakness. Where for me, a male who actually wants to be, have a virgin on, uh, be a virgin on his, on his wedding night, to me, that is amazing strength. That's strength. I mean, that is strength that is, is, is hard to comprehend how strength, strength you are. But other males see it as a weakness. Now you've been socialized in prison. Now, uh, socialized in prison. Now, our prisons, our prisons have got the numbers gags. So uh, in a lot of sections, especially up in the Western Cape. That's exactly the person you, I was speaking to. You, you've, was got like the you've got a choice. You've got a choice. Rape or be raped. And then what happens in prison, prisons, the social networking and the socialization takes place there. There's roles to still take place. So they need a male to take a role mm. of as a woman. Mm. So if they will then take away that masculinity. And I think that's what rape, rape does. I was asked once, what's the difference between a female being raped and a male being raped? Mm. And I say, a male being raped has taken the essence of his masculinity by how it's determined by society. And that's what happens in the prisons. They've taken the person and they've taken that masculinity away from him. And then in, in, in prison, so in prisons, it is dreadful what's happening in our prisons because it's not being reported, the authorities. I mean, if we just have a look at a microcosm of, of women having enormous problems reporting it to the police, it's 10 times worse for men. And now when you're in prison and, you, and you're incarcerated, that I have a lot of fights with a lot of people who say, if you were raped in prison, you did the crime, that, that goes with the prison sentence. No, it doesn't. Nobody, nobody under any circumstances, if you're in prison, if you were drugs, drugged, if you were, if you were absolutely intoxicated, nobody has the right to rape you. And I think even as males, I mean, I did a, a, a lecture once at a university and they all thought it was very funny in the beginning because they didn't know who I was and all of that. And I said, yeah, it's a story about dropping the soap in, in the shower. And everybody thought it was, was funny. Mm. So you socialize that violent, male violence against males is acceptable. We had an advert on the, on, on the TV about drinking and driving, mm. where the guy used to say, hey, you know, I'm looking for you in prison. Mm. And it was all that. Basically in saying that if you drink and drive and you land up in prison, you're, you're going, going to, to be raped. raped. Yeah. And it's acceptable. And everybody thought, what a great advert. But what you're saying is drinking and driving is wrong. But what you're saying is that if Being you're raped, raped in, in prison, prison, it's fine. It's fine. And this is the way as, as, as males. Males are violent towards each other. Mm. So we always, and, and for me, that is one of the critical issues. We need to teach our young boys and we as males have to learn empathy. I'm glad you mentioned that because I saw a thread on Twitter where somebody was speaking about, you know, men are also victims of toxic masculinity. Mm. And then somebody commented, but men created toxic masculinity. Mm. So trust men to complain about something that they created. How do we break that? And I'll start with you, Duki. How do, how do we change that perception? Because yes, like you say, kids are laughing at the drop the soap, soap joke. Yeah. I see South African humor as masking trauma. Yeah. Most of our humor, we joke about the things that yeah. we're not ready to face. So it's easy to joke yeah. about, 
oh, you're going to, did you pick up the soap? Because you don't want to mm. hear the person say, actually, I was in a holding cell and I got raped while mm. police officers were watching and didn't mm. say nothing. I, I wonder if it's easy to disabuse the public mind away from such notions and perceptions. Earlier on, if I may share this experience, I was at a mall to try and prepare for this meeting. And as I got into a pub to buy data, I saw this beautiful young woman and I said to her, you know, I've been following you since FNB. And she says to me, no, no, don't follow me, men are trash. And in fact, I'm an, I'm an, I'm, I'm an ardent feminist and I believe that toxic masculinity is the curse of mankind. And I said to her, but you don't even know me, how can I be trash? And even before I said to her, do you know I've written about rape, I've published about gender-based violence, and I'm an advocate myself. But because you don't know me, and because I'm gendered as a male person, immediately then that means I may be prone to raping, I may be prone to being violent, or even meting out any form of injustice against another human being. And that's why I say it's, it may be a bit difficult to say, how do we, as male, as male persons, come to accept that we are the creators of toxic masculinity? I think society as a whole has a role to play, mm -hmm. and we are all equally responsible. Because in my township where I grew up at, you would find young women saying, if a gang shy, a gang tan, if it doesn't beat me up, it means he doesn't love me. He may be doing it to someone else. And you'll find some young women saying, if she doesn't prove to you that she is faithful, it means she won't sleep with you. It's probably because she's sleeping with someone else. And you'd find both genders accepting abnormality as a norm mm. and, and as some, something that's tolerable. Hence, I'm saying, if we were to say toxic masculinity was created by males only, and it's their exclusive domain, we are somewhat wrong. Females and males have a role to play. And I think each gender has to sit down and say, <clears throat> This is how I've been socialized, and this is how I perceive you mm. to be. And the next can also do that, and we start a joint conversation. Look, it's not about women only being yes. victims of femicide or being victims of GPV. We too are. Look, while we, while one might argue, which is I think is a separate discussion, who who created toss toxic masculinity. Me being the feminist that I am, and the same person will say, women are the gatekeepers of all forms of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So I do agree with you in the sense that women do have a role to play. You can't be the first one when your four-year-old son is crying to say, boys don't cry, be a big boy. It starts very early on mm -hmm. in terms of the messaging of what, what is acceptable for what a boy should be, what is acceptable for what a girl should be in a home, which obviously feeds into this... Um, it's, it's almost like the toxic masculinity is an ecosystem that is just living in thriving beautifully. Dirk, what has your experience been? I mean, um, you now are grown up, you've, you've, you've gotten a better understanding of your trauma, even though, like you say, you still find yourself triggered, you still experience flashbacks. Um, how would you see what society has told you to be having impacted in how you got to where you are today and where are you today? Um, I think what I learned from what happened to me is I became a, a protector. Um, my, my job also today involves protecting children, helping children that went through abuse. So um, I went completely and utterly the way that I need to not just help people that went through this, but stop this from happening. It, it, you know that saying... Don't stop helping people out of the river. Go up the river and see why they fell in. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am and that's what my mission is today, to use my experience, what happened to me, how bad it was, to help other people and to get to the point of this, to stop it. Have you also been asked um, what was the reason this happened to you? Have, has that question been posed of you? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any reason. You know, it all comes down to free will. Human have free will. So there's, there's no reason um, that God allowed this to happen to me. Or um, I struggled with the church and God for a very long time. And it took a while before I turned back to God and the church. But I realized that it's, it's free will. It's, it's human sin. And that is not God that made something happen. 
You know, sometimes I, I, I do understand why a person would pose that question. If it's coming from the perspective of, I don't know if you've heard people say, oh my gosh, I'm a cancer survivor and the cancer was the best thing that happened to me. And they'll give their reasons. Mm. <laughs> I got perspective. I appreciate my children. So I think that... And I, I could be very mm. wrong. Could be the reason that somebody says, there must be a reason mm. this happened to you. We see survivors mm. who come out and say, oh, since this happened to me, now I've changed. I appreciate my family mm. more. Do, do you think, I don't know from your side, Uguke, do you think that's possibly where that messaging might come from of when you sit and do introspection? Ink, like, why you? Why, why you? Why that day? Do you, do you have those messages playing in your mind? Uh, I do sometimes. I do ask myself, would, why me? But I'm glad with him. I have changed. I have become a better person now. Even though whatever happened, but I have become a better person. I want to do more for people and where I'm from, because I grew up in a, in, a, in a hostel where you're scared to be yourself, where everything is happening there, you being judged and, and, and. So I want to change that. I want to give back to my community and say, thank you for making me who am I today. Mm. Reese, from your side, I mean, yeah. use, using the, the cancer survivor analogy. Yeah. I think that whoever's been through whatever trauma, it's how you process it. Mm. And some of us will process it and We'll be addictive, we'll, be, we'll find a million and one reasons why we can't get out of the thing. Others who move from victim to survivor, what we call thriver, is the cancer victim, is to say, this happened to me. I'm one of the fortunate individuals who's managed to cope with it physically and mm -hmm. mentally. How can I make the trauma that I experienced how can I make it easier for another person? Mm. So I don't look at it as that I'm a survivor and I'm doing the work I am. Mm. I'm looking at it as I'm a survivor and I managed to get through it. There's millions of people out there, men, women, children, who are not getting through their trauma. Mm. So if, if, if I can just help one and use my experiences and the knowledge and the skills that I've, I've developed through peer-to-peer -peer support, if I can just help one person and they pay it, pay it forward, we'll be able to do it. I mean, I always look at the, the elephant story. It's, I love it always. I use it overseas and they find it. The only way to eat an elephant is bite by bite. Mm. And the only way we're going to be dealing with this and my trauma. And also, it's part of the healing process. It's very much part of the healing process mm. is that a, lo a lot of the males think that they can come and we can have peer-to-peer -peer support or... Anybody who's involved in trauma, and it's, that's the end of it, it's not. It's an ongoing... It's an ongoing yeah. thing, and life can be brilliant, and it can all fall apart at, at, at a drop of a hat. And you're going to have to pick it up again, mm. and you're going to have it. And that's what they were talking about, the triggers. I mean, even to come back to that, have any of you experienced your triggers in an intimate space? where things that you were not even aware were there affected you? I have a couple of times. Mm. And what, what was that experience for you? <laughs> so, as I said before, I've been married twice. And the first marriage ended because each time I failed to express myself due to these triggers, I used to get bitten to remember how to be intimate whereas I'd never been taught to be intimate. And this happened for about three years until when I eventually went into a psychiatric ward for an evaluation and they said to me, you've already tipped the skills, you're there. It's just that you haven't started acting crazy, but you actually are crazy already. And the triggers for me would happen each time when someone would wear lingerie, someone would dim the lights, and someone would do all these sexually suggestive things and each time it happens my mind would go back to when the young girl came into my place without my consent she slipped into my bed stripped naked 
started touching me and things happened. And my wife, who wasn't there at the time, couldn't understand why each time she would touch me, I would see the young girl and immediately remove the hand. Each time she would try to kiss me, I would think of the young woman not wanting to swallow the morning after pill. And each time she would ask, what happened? I would think of my friend who had organized this young woman not telling me the honest truth behind why he was leaving that weekend and how come on the Monday he knew what happened before I even confessed to him. So triggers do exist. And this is one of the things I say, it's the past that never passed it. It has never passed. Mm. I fail to be intimate. People see me and think husband material. They think a potential father figure and they think an upstanding member of society. I am seeing myself as a hot mess. But I'll never tell them because nobody would believe me. Mm. I don't look like one. I don't act like one. But I definitely feel like one. Mm. Mm. Dirk, in your, in your uh, experience, um, I mean, your sexual trauma happened to you as a child. Um, did you struggle with intimacy as you got older? and um you know were being intimate with your partners very badly yes um i think my biggest thing was that intimacy was programmed into my mind from a young child that it's something that is wrong that it's secret um, nobody is supposed to know about it so it, it becomes a dark um, ugly thing and to to train your mind that intimacy between two people that love each other is actually something really beautiful. Um, took took a long time, and, I, and on that note, it takes a special kind of partner that can work through this with you. Um, I've also been married, I'm divorced, um, I've been with my partner now for about six years. Um, it really does take a very special person to work through it with you because to get yourself to realize that it isn't bad, it isn't sin, it isn't ugly, it, it shouldn't be hidden. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, not just for you, but for your partner as well. Mm -hmm. okay, I mean, for your experience is, is three years um, ago. Have you found that dating and intimacy has been difficult with partners? For me, no. Because after uh, 2018, I got engaged to some other guy too. But things didn't work out cause the guy loved sex more than, and I was not that type at that mm -hmm. stage. So every time we will fight about it and said to me, yeah, maybe I've slept with someone earlier. Mm -hmm. Cause he's always at work, I'm always at home. Said, yeah, you will sleep, you, you were busy during the day and ended. So I started we started being toxic in a relationship. Mm. Things didn't work out. And then I got another guy, same thing. Did you ever um, disclose to the man you engaged to yes. about your experience? Yes. So he never he thought everything. to himself, oh, maybe this is a challenge because this happened to him. Yeah. That's mm. why I ended things because it's all about him. It's all about him. What happened to me doesn't care. Even if I, I told him I'm not in a good space, he's going to say, yeah, you were busy during the day. And, and, and. so I started to be toxic mm. and fight about it. Mm. Um, Risa, I mean, from, from the, you know, obviously you work with mm. many different male survivors. What are some of the experiences that they share with you in terms of challenges? Um, you know, from the, from the three mm. genes that we're speaking to, their response might not be the opposite, which could be promiscuous. Now you get the mm. man who um, he's responding by, you know, having sex everywhere with everyone and having zero emotional connections. I, I think the emotional connection is the important thing that mm. in, in what you said is that uh, a lot of people think that intimacy, and a lot of men who come to me, we, we again, socialize to think int intimacy means sex. Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't. And a lot of men who are having intimacy pr uh, prob uh, problems, that's how they measure the intimacy. Intimacy is about the meeting of a mind, mm -hmm. emotionally. Emotionally. So you can have very intimate moments with very little touch. So a lot of them, or no touch, or no touch. Mm. So, 
So some of the men come in and yes, um, the, the intimacy issues is when they least expect it, they get a flashback. Some men have got um, performance anxiety because now they've had a flashback once in their life. Now the rest of the times, every time they have sex, they're worried they're going to have that flashback again. So, so just having, we, we are clear about what yeah, we're saying. I understand what you mean by yeah, performance anxiety, yeah, okay. but so we're clear as in when it comes time for you to be yeah, having sex with your partner, your erection is not happening or it's yeah. not even surviving the it's moment. Not, okay, uh, I got It's you. not surviving there because, and now, because they're worried about something that happened once. Mm. So now the other side of the equation is, is that some, a, a, a lot of, Rape, male rape, the victim and the perpetrator know each other. There's some connection. It's not just necessary, random. It can be, but most of the time. In sexual abuse of children, it is known to the individual and to their family. So there's an element of trust there, and that trust is broken. And sometimes men can't get their trust again. So they will be promiscuous, mm. and because they don't trust anybody, they're having sex for the sake of having sex but zero connection zero. absolutely zero connection between themselves the other side of the spectrum is the man who now is not forming any emotional connections but is going around having sex with everybody um and because we have this perception of what intimacy is they're not even aware of what's happening no so they're going to have the, they want sex and that is it N nothing nothing more nothing less mm. And then the other men, um, other males could go for prostitution, uh, go into prostitution. Because they actually, they will go to a prostitute, they will hate themselves afterwards. Mm. But they want to relive that hate. That they actually hated themselves in previous, uh, when they were abused or sexually violated. Why, they, why, they why do they want to relive the hate? Because in my mind, when you said that, I thought yeah. to myself, it's almost like, you're going to go the route of something where, where um, you are experiencing self-hate, but because you don't believe you deserve anything more than that. It could be because they're blaming themselves. Mm. A lot of ma men blame themselves. They spend their whole life blaming themselves. So even though they, they've, they've gone through a healing process again, sunny happens and they blame themselves. So by actually going into that position of using a prostitute and after the sex they actually despise themselves mm. they're reliving something that have, has happened to them in their past mm. because they also as you said they don't think they are worthy enough to have the affection of love by somebody else because a lot of the in 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 the socialize in in the grooming process of a man they totally groom to believe that it is their doing mm. that they want it and then you have the uh, then you have the, uh, the the males who will actually go into some type of bondage or they want some other type of sexual gratification because they find that nothing nothing gratifies them ever, anymore because so, that that part of them is almost like numb or yeah. dead inside so they need to go to the extreme the extreme and the yeah. extreme they get the exhilaration they get the the the, the feeling that they want mm. out of that extreme so every, every, as you said in the beginning, and it was rightfully what you said, is that every traumatic experience of everybody is different yeah. and has different consequences and different results and different outcomes. Can I ask a, a difficult question of all of you? Do you believe that women coercing men into sex also qualifies as rape? And I'll come to you last, uh, Doki, because your experience, I mean, you've shared already. Um, Dirk, what are your thoughts on that? Because a lot of people still have this per perception that, you know, um, men can't be raped. But I'm speaking specific coercion as in me blackmailing my partner till he feels so bad that he, he does it. Would you consider that rape as well? Definitely. I don't think there's, there's a difference between a man or a woman mm. to be the perpetrator or the victim. Um, definitely. It, at the end of the day, it's not really about the sex, it's about power. Mm. Um, most perpetrators get off on the power. It's not about the actual deed. It's, so, yeah. And the fact that a person is doing something they don't actually want to do. Mm. Mm. 
Uh, your thoughts on that, Ogushe? I can say that rape is rape, whether it's men or a woman. Whoever does it, it's a rape. That's what I can say. Toki, uh, I mean, you, you have first-hand experience um, of being raped by a woman, and it's not common that men will share that story. What would you want um, people watching at home to know um, about your experience just in terms of the perception of men being raped by women? I think more, more than people understanding, I wish the legal system would be equally cognizant of such dynamics. Because as you rightfully enunciated on earlier on, it may be perceived as statutory rape if, for example, I have been copulated with a younger woman Mm. And it may not be perceived as rape if an older woman approached me, I may be jokingly called a Ben 10. Mm. So mm. I think the dynamic and perception, especially in black communities, mm. we don't call rape rape. It has a different name, different meaning altogether. Mm. I, all, I know almost every family has a victim of rape. Every black family knows someone who's been a victim or perpetrator of rape but we don't call it rape. It's never been given that name mm. until such time that black communities, because I identify more with them, understand that it can happen, coercion mm. of any form. It could be political. In my case, for example, where I stay, it's largely political coercion that happens, mm. where women are promised employment by people who hold political office. Mm. And it happens oftentimes because you've got so many tender premiers in townships, and also because religion is huge. You've got a lot of pastors who are accused of rape but mm. hardly ever go to prison. You've got people who occupy high office in churches, women in particular, who are known to be abusing band leaders or mm. band members mm. or whoever has some role of eminence at church. But it's never diagnosed, identified or understood as rape. It is something totally different. And there's this abnormal sickening culture of not wanting to speak about things as they are. It is what it is, but we don't identify it. As I'm saying, until such time that black society in particular understands that when you do something against someone's will, which is coercion or any other form of manipulation of black men, if the person says no, it means no. It does not mean try harder. I think what, what I struggle with beyond the justice system itself. You know, if I were to call somebody to say, I've, I just got raped, the first thing they're gonna say is, what did they do? Mm -hmm. And already the responsibility <laughs> on the victim to now have to explain, mm -hmm. already I think makes significantly less people willing to come forward. We don't automatically say, I believe you. We need to hear a story of, but I was drugged or I was, I don't know if, if, mm. if, if that is coming through clearly, but if I, I know if I called my mom, because this is how she raised me, um, and being a nurse, having seen the things that she saw, that she'd constantly tell me, if you're touched like this, if this happens to you, if somebody says this to you, you have to tell me. And the moment I felt uncomfortable, the first person I told was my mom. And again, family, friend, the grooming situation where it could have gone much further, but my mom literally nailed it into my head. If I picked up a phone and I said, Mama, I've been raped, she would not ask me what happened, all these questions. She would believe me immediately. So it's a societal issue beyond the legal side. And I don't know if, if you agree with how I'm expressing this, uh, Reese. Mm. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's the, the, situation you had with your mother i mean that that is unique yeah. that is absolutely unique because the rest of us we tell women we tell children we tell young boys we tell everybody no is no mm. right however we do not empower our children to say no we tell them to say no but when a child says i don't want to do that mm. you tell the child you will do that because yeah. of that or oh, oh, because I'm a grown-up, which now instills into your head that so, if a grown-up says, you must yeah. do this. So we have to equip our children to question. We have to equip 
our children to say no. We have to grow up and accept that we have to accept sometimes a child, child saying no. But also just to add to what you were saying there, uh, Doki, around the fact that you need to call rape what it is. Yes. A big thing that my mom taught me, I mean, people mm. say, where did you learn about <laughs> sex? I learned about sex from my mother. She bought me a book called Where Do I Come From? And mm. she said to me, we're not going to use funny terms that people mm. want to use. You're going to know the name of exactly we're gonna you're gonna know the name of a vagina you're gonna know the name of a penis in Setswana which mm. sidebar in our cultural languages when you use the actual name <laughs> of private parts it 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 is considered a swear word even mm. though that's the actual word mm. so saying BB and all these other words that mm. parents give these cute names mm. that they give to your private parts what ends up happening now you've been violated because mm. now your pa- mm. the parent thinks they're not ready to learn about mm. sex they're not ready to learn about private parts how do you expect that child to articulate what has happened mm. to them if you didn't even give them the correct names for their private parts or explain to them what is the function of this private part i mean you s- you've hit it on the nail that we need to give our children the language to be able to communicate with us and also males we need to give them a language males predominantly who i deal with males are are emotionally illiterate oh, they don't that was know, so well said they do not know how to explain themselves they know if they're sad mad happy they, they probably got an emotional uh, a, um, mm. vocab of 10 names they don't know how to express it why because they were never taught it. An adult who is illiterate because they can't read is because they were never taught it. A male who is illiterate because he can't communicate how he's feeling is exactly, he was never, he was never taught what that experience was. But I, but I think to add on to that, if your own father can't come to you to speak about what an erection is, if, you're, if, mm. if, if we keep leaving our boys and the sons of the communities to be taught about sex, and uh, sexual encounters through their friends. I mean, we've had a guest on the show who shared with us where he grew up, they told you, this is how you make a girl your, your girlfriend. You force her, you force yourself on her, and mm. she submits to you and she's mm. your girlfriend. But if you don't have a male figure that is teaching you what intimacy mm. is, which is yeah. not just sex, that is teaching you that this is what happens to your body and, 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 mm. uh, what do we expect to happen to our society? Men have to step up. Yeah, yeah. Men have to step up. And men have to just not step up to take in their roles. Men have to step up at calling other men out. And that's exactly what you said. We, we, we're working on not calling rape, rape. Because a male would say, oh, she was drunk, and then I took her over there. If, we need to start saying, you mean you actually had sex with a drunk woman? You know? That's rape. That's rape. And actually making that person realize that it's no longer cool. But I think because it diminishes responsibility. So some of the men who I've seen being called out on social Mm. media for for rape and sexual assault, they'll say things like, I'm so sorry you felt, Mm. or I don't remember it like that. Mm. I'm sorry you felt like you were violated. Mm. But they never say, I'm sorry I violated you. They don't take ownership of 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 that mm. but again i i don't want to diminish the role of women in the con in the conversation as well uh gentlemen just to wrap up dirk i'm going to start with you final words for the guests watching at home and you know the young boy or the young man who may have experienced what you have gone through but has never told a soul um it's not your fault it's never been your fault and talking about it helps speak to someone about it mm. Doki, from your side? Well, I've, 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 I've had the privilege of enjoying a double whammy. One is surviving the traumas of rape and then also having to encounter the trauma of not knowing how to be a father once you've impregnated someone. And it's difficult because, again, we as a society would say to the person, you knew the consequences before you even did it. What if that happened because a male person was raped or they were coerced through means that they had no control over? And so for myself, I think I had to undergo a long and very laborious process of dealing with myself first. It's, not, it's always easier for us to say men must do one, two, three. 
but society doesn't look at us as a complete whole. They individualize us. So for me, in order to heal from my own past traumas, I decided to write about it. But my writing also was not saying to me, you are writing because you want to heal. I wrote because I needed to understand exactly what abuse was. Mm. And now that I'm a father, I wanted to understand what is the cry of a child who wants you to connect with them emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, and otherwise as a father. But because you have your own past traumas, you can't. So for me, I would say writing helped. And I would encourage anyone who wants to know more, understand abuse in its multiple forms or different permutations to look at the books I've written. The one is this one here. Mm. Don't know if it appears. Yeah. And then this, this is the other one as well. So it's, we don't call it abuse because society doesn't call it abuse. It's something totally different. Hence, it becomes tolerable. And me saying, Father, hear my cry, it was a cry to all males to say, listen to yourself first as a crying, bleeding person. Heal yourself before you go out and prove to someone else that you are man enough. Mm. Olusia, from your side, I mean, it's your first interview and i can't thank you enough for coming to open up i mean i literally mm. just saw your tweet and i said to the team please can we ask him to join us i didn't think he would be ready uh, to come and talk and i'm so happy that you did come and talk what would you like to share with everyone at home learn to speak out and learn to fight as a man learn to fight and learn to speak out stand stand and talk about everything don't be ashamed would see people are gonna talk. Mm. Just open up and everything is gonna be okay. Riz, from your side, I mean, you've been doing this work for a while and we'll make sure that we put all of the details on the screen for the organization and where they can get help. What are your final words, um, you know, just to the viewers who may be, have their mind blow, minds blown right now that, wow, I never knew all of the things you're telling me, wow, this happened to me. I think as you've said, and I want to reiterate it again because it was so important, we believe you. And I think it is a, a personal decision that any victim has to make is, is he going to allow the perpetrator to control their lives way after the, after the trauma that they went through? that the only way they've been able to do it and is to speak out. And I'm not saying speak out in television programs. Mm -hmm. Find that one person who you believe will, will listen to you, will acknowledge you, mm -hmm. will respect you, and will show you the empathy. Because just by doing that, you've evicted the perpetrator and all the power that he ever had. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of these circumstances, it is the secrecy that keeps you in the victim survivor. And it is in that secrecy that you have to, have to go out and, and share with somebody. Because mm. once you've broken that, the healing process can start. Mm. If I can just go back to... Well, now my mind's gone. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> what, what I wanted to say is beyond... And it, was, it wasn't raised mm. in our discussion beyond us saying that you know you empower yourself mm. by breaking the silence i think we we mustn't overlook the power of speaking out means that you could possibly protect somebody else and i'm mm. not saying anybody should be rushed into speaking mm. out mm. speak out when you're ready but we also must be cognizant of the fact that you know your silence a victim's silence can mean another victim where they may mm. no longer have to be a victim. And all I can hope is as South Africans that as a society, we come to the table in these discussions and we also, you know, stand up when we need to. We call things out mm. when we need to. We call things out by the names we need to. I hope that uh, the generations before us come to the table and I hope that our legal system definitely reflects the changes that we need to see in our society so that they can support um, all victims. Of, of especially of these type of crimes. Gentlemen, thank you so, so much for joining us on the show. I appreciate your vulnerability and in being open and I don't take lightly at all that uh, you were able to come into the space and feel safe enough to speak about your experience. But I, I'm so sure that somebody's mm. watching that has been helped and if only one person has been helped, that mm. is enough for me. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And there you have it from us here on Unpacked. 
I did say that it is going to be a tough discussion, but I still do believe that this is only the beginning. We'll make sure that we put all of the details down below where you can get help if you feel that you are a victim. If you feel that you're a survivor and you want to share and also join support groups, details are right there. Thank you for joining us. That's Unpacked with Rilebukhile Maboja. New episodes weekdays at 5.30 p.m. on my YouTube page. Don't forget to subscribe. Television edited broadcast weekdays at 5 p.m. Open up with S3.